The Keynesian consensus reigned during the 1960s. It stated that there was a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. Despite the consensus reigning and the vision of the Phillips curve taking center stage, in the background, there was a developing monetarist school that was building momentum. A critical turning point in macro history was going to be based on their debate with the Keynesians over the Phillips curve. And leading the way for the monetarists was Milton Friedman. He felt the trade-off between inflation and unemployment only held in the short run. In the long run, continual attempts at lowering unemployment through inflation would lead towards inflationary rates that were out of hand. This thinking kept in line with the monetarist view that discretionary monetary policy, that activist monetary policy, shouldn't be used to try to keep unemployment below its natural rate. And it also kept in line with the monetarist vision that the economy, if left to its own devices, would be adjusted by the price system. Even if aggregate demand is controlled by the Fed's manipulation of the money supply and interest rates, the monetarist would argue the economy is still going to respond and adjust. The debate over the Phillips curve was really pushed forward in two ways. The 1970s saw both an oil shock and the implementation of policies that treated the Phillips curve as truth by then Fed Chairman Arthur Burns. Let's quickly consider the oil shock first. In the 1970s, the United States saw a large negative shock to the supply of oil. Gas prices jumped and the United States attempted price controls, which led to long lines, shortages, and unrest, very much in line with what basic microeconomic models would suggest. The price of oil, a very important resource, skyrocketed. And a rise in the resource prices drives short-run aggregate supply curves to the left. So we get a jump back of the short-run aggregate supply curve. When the short-run aggregate supply curve is pushed back and to the left, what happens to unemployment? Well, unemployment is going to rise. What happens to the price level? Well, the price level is going to rise. When we move from our original equilibrium here up to a point here at our new equilibrium, when we have this negative shock, when we have this negative shock, when the short run aggregate supply curve moves back into the left, what do we have? We have a situation with higher unemployment and a higher price level or inflation. Where would this be on our Phillips curve graph? We see both higher inflation and high unemployment. That combination just doesn't jive well with the original vision of the Phillips curve. We have to be somewhere along the curve. The curve is our menu, it's our options. We're going to be at one of those places. When we have this oil shock, we get high inflation and high unemployment. We're not on the Phillips curve. Okay, so now let's turn from the oil shock's role to the failed attempt at activist Phillips curve manipulation policy. Arthur Burns was the Fed chairman. He had been nominated by Richard Nixon in 1969 and took office in 1970. Despite the supposed independence of the Federal Reserve, Burns was selected in part because he was a loyal Republican who seemed willing to play ball. It is often claimed that once Burns was the chairman, Nixon exerted influence over Burns. Evidence from the Nixon tapes are now is now available to researchers, and it lends some strong evidence to these claims, as it is clear that there was pressure on Burns to at least engage in expansionary monetary policies in the run-up to the 1972 election. Burns was a very established economist, though, and we must remember this is not just politics gone bad. The common view among economists in the 1960s was that there existed a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. It was the Keynesian consensus. The Phillips curve policies follow the basic logic of the Phillips curve graph. We start at the natural rate of unemployment level of say 5%. Here we have a continual inflation rate of pi one. This is the rate of inflation everyone has adjusted to. And therefore we end up with an unemployment rate at in this case 5%. 
the lowest level of unemployment that we can sustain in the long run, our natural rate of unemployment. We could take advantage of the Phillips curves trade-off between inflation and unemployment by getting our rate of unemployment down to 4% if we would like. But if we're gonna do that, we have to take on some additional inflation. So if we wanna reduce our unemployment from five down to 4%, that's fine, but our inflation rate is going to have to go up from pi one up to pi two, right? So our inflation will have to jump. So we can get to a level of unemployment below the natural rate, but with just a little, we're gonna to have to be willing to take on some inflation as well. In the 1960s and early 1970s, the campers, the Keynesian consensus, which was most economists, thought that there was a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, that at a lower rate of unemployment, we could get there if we were willing to tolerate just a little bit more inflation. And this was the menu that we faced. The oil shock showed us this isn't the only menu that's there, but this is the menu that we faced according to their policy, and we were gonna to start to try and take advantage of it. This is what Nixon wanted. This is what Burns went with. The Phillips curve view that there was this stable trade-off provided the foundation for the policies of the 1970s. Inflation would be used to lower unemployment. Monetary policy, policy was so central that in 1971, Nixon led the way to a complete abandoning of the gold standard, which had started way back in the Great Depression. Activist Phillips curve centric policy surged ahead and the path was cleared to pump money into the economy to increase output and reduce unemployment. Unfortunately, the inflation of the 1970s led to high rates of both inflation and unemployment. We call this stagflation, high inflation with high unemployment. It is what we see with the oil shock and it is what we saw a lot during the 1970s. If we have the 1960 camper vision, the Keynesian consensus view that the Phillips curve is a menu from which to choose, seeing stagflation makes no sense. You cannot have high inflation and high unemployment at the same time. The US was experiencing economic turmoil in the 1970s, and that turmoil was stagflation. You can see this on the graph pictured, which is Arthur O'Kun's misery index, which adds together the inflation and unemployment rates to showcase a representation of the misery in an economy in the 1970s certainly sticks out. We cannot have this in the camper vision of the Phillips curve. The aggregate demand can be high and we can get high inflation, but when we do that, we're going to have low unemployment. This is seen here with the green dots. Or we can have aggregate demand be low. But if aggregate demand is low, we get low inflation and high unemployment. This is shown with the purple dots in this picture. But high inflation and high unemployment is not an option on our curve. The reality of the 1970s was stagflation, and thus economists were forced to conclude that we can't inflate at a higher level and expect unemployment to be persistently low. In other words, Milton Friedman was right, and the Keynesian consensus was wrong. Friedman had been making arguments in the 1960s about the Phillips curve not being a long-run policy tool, but it was not until the 1970s when we started to actually try to take advantage of the relationship that he was proven right. The Phillips curve seemed to hold in the short run if all monetary shocks were unexpected. But once the Phillips curve became a policy menu to choose from, people began to expect the monetary influx and the Phillips curve began to fall apart. Click on the video to see how modeling of expectations helps us understand how the Phillips curve could fall apart and how macroeconomic history is changed from this debate.